Fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you. Uh, you know, I was about uh, 13 years old together at Trinity, first as a PhD student and then about 10 years as a fellow. But I think we did we overlap. Um, I think probably I've been in Trinity for 25 years now. Uh, when, so, what time did you start? 1995 or six. Ah, that's after me. I, I did my PhD 78 to 81 and then was a fellow between, I, uh, first I was research fellow, you know, in this competition from, mm. when was that? It was 81 to 86 or so. And then 86, I became teaching fellow and director of studies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, belated congratulations on the junior research fellowship, which we all know is the most competitive, uh, you know, award. <laughs> in, in in science internationally <laughs> uh, you know i i thought i wouldn't get it i they called me the, yeah. my tutor anil seal he called me at 11 at night you know i wrote my thesis in seven days for the trinity fellowship because i thought i had no chance i thought i could never get it and then seven days yeah. before you know one week before i thought shit you know if i don't try i can never get it so i have to do it well so, you know you've uh, you've established a precedent a PhD in seven days. <laughs> Not a PhD, the Trinity Fellowship. PhD took a lot longer because once I was okay. starting to eat on that table. <laughs> right, okay. And also the Trinity Fellowship, essentially it was my PhD thesis, but without the introduction and without the big summary mm. at the end, you know, it was kind of the bare bones results and, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, people are coming now. So at seven, we usually start with introductions. Wait a sec, how can I see? Speakers? So I'm just going to get um, a glass of water whilst we're waiting. Oh, yes, yes. You'll need sure. more. Than I'll, one be, I'll be right back. You'll need more than one glass. <laughs> Oh, hello, Shankar. Hello. Hello. It's to fantastic see you again. to see you again. Thank you. Uh, the, today is really superstars here. Uh, and today we have, uh, Shankar, we have about 25 people here today. And Great. so it won't be time to introduce all of them. I found a way to contact more students. So we have about 10 Trinity students here today as well. Oh, that's terrific. And I can maybe, Shanka, I can, uh, Simon is getting some water, but while he yeah, I'm, I'm is back. getting his water, I can introduce you to Professor Ozumi. Where is she now? Ah, here, Noriko. Noriko? Oh, hi. Ah, Noriko, I, yes. uh, Thank you. I, I, I would like to introduce you to Shankar Bala Subramanian. Okay, great. Who Thank you very I mentioned much. to you, you know. And uh, uh, Shankar, you met uh, the colleagues from Tohoku University. Yes. And Noriko Osumi is a vice president of Tokyo University. <laughs> and she looks at the genetics of autism. So she kind of bridges uh, both your uh, Simon's and your work. Okay. Uh, Good to see you online. <laughs> and uh, you know when I uh, Shanka was uh, on one of our previous previous Zoom sessions, and when I prepared for that, I was just blown away by his work. He's just amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know one of the many many things he's done is he. Is one of the co in he's the co inventor of two inventors who invented the next generation uh, DNA uh, um, analysis uh, methods, which you probably use in your lab, I guess. Mm, yes, yeah, wonderful. So you're yes. a customer, probably, of, of right, <laughs> it changed the world. Ah, Simon, you are back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Anka is here now. Also, I just introduced yeah. 
uh, Professor Osomi and uh, o Osomi and Shankar. Yeah. No. Hi, Shankar. Thank you for joining us today. Simon, it's good to see you again. The last time we met was we had lunch just before the pandemic started, didn't we? Yeah, I think it was the the last day before lockdown, <laughs> the first lockdown. <laughs> um, so a lot has happened since then. Indeed, indeed. Maybe I can uh, I can introduce. You know, I had it uh, headhunted some of the Japanese leaders in the field of autism who are not connected yet or not connected to Trinity except by our discussion today. So maybe I'll introduce some of them if they respond here. Professor Yamasue, are you here? Are you, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, great. Hi. Uh, uh, maybe I'm, you I'm can really introduce Yamasue. yourself. We have two Trinity superstars here. One is Simon Baron Cohen, of course, who is the speaker today, but we also have Shankar Subramanian here, who is a previous speaker uh, of our Zoom discussions here. And Shankar, he has done uh, a wide range of results and work, but the most, maybe the most known, he's most known for, for the next generation uh, uh, genetic uh, analysis, uh, you know, which uh, he's also founded a company and maybe you uh, are a customer of his company, use his machine. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Hiroli Yamasue uh, from uh, Hamamatsu University uh, School of Medicine and uh, I have been uh, conducting uh, some uh, clinical research, uh, such as neuroimaging or, uh, and uh, uh, clinical trial of uh, intranatal distortion in uh, individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And also, uh, I have uh, some uh, genetic studies. Yeah. And, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you. Maybe Noriko, can you introduce yourself again uh, to both okay. Chanta and Simon um, and also all of us and, and to tell us what you do. Thank you very much. So my name is Noriko Osumi. I'm vice president of Dove University and also I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Medicine. And uh, so I'm so much interested in the brain development. And so I have more interest in the, the mechanism of the autism. So today I'm very much looking forward to uh, the talk by uh, Sir uh, Baron Cohen. So very glad to see you online. Thank you very much. Uh, then we have Takamitsu Watanabe. Uh, do you like, uh, or oh, next year, wait a sec, this is moving around. Uh, Norihiko Sadate, uh, no. Do you like to introduce yourself, Norihiro? Uh, so yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Norihiro Sadato, at, uh, working at the National Institute for Physiological Sciences, mainly focusing on the, uh, the, uh, the social interaction uh, the investigated by the functional MRI by double. Uh, what I mean is the imaging, the, uh, the interacting two persons at the same time. And uh, the, certainly I'm, uh, I'm quite interested in the uh, the pathophysiology of the autism itself. And therefore, I'm looking forward to uh, the, uh, the attending to the this meetings uh, very much. Thank you very Thank you much. For, Thank you for joining. Next one, uh, uh, Takamitsu Watanabe Sensei. I uh, can. Do you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I I am uh, just a associate professor in the uh, University of Tokyo. International Research Center for New Intelligence, so-called ISCM, or something like that. And uh, I'm also um, doing some, I'm, I'm basically a human neuroimager using like MRI or EEG or something like that. And uh, yeah, and uh, doing some, try to find out some kind of the uh, microscopic brain state dynamics <laughs> behind the uh, typical and uh, atypical human intelligence, especially high-functioning autistic stuff. And I, actually, I was in London until 2018 in UCL, uh, Gannon Reese Love, uh, the uh, Marie Curie Research Fellow, or something like that. And uh, so, so I have, I don't have any direct connection with you know, Trinity College. But uh, in fact, during my high school days, I spent about three weeks in Garden College in. Cambridge just to just for a kind of summer school 
for English or something like that. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Then uh, Sadato Sensei, did you introduce yourself already or do you like to do? Uh, Sadato Sensei. Yes, yes. I'm here. And uh, at, uh, I think uh, at, uh, another at, uh, at the expert on the uh, autism is Dr. Senju. Probably he's here before. Oh. At the, he could uh, introduce himself. Okay, Senju, yes, I found him. Just one thing, I, I, uh, Dr. Senju, do you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, sure, um, um, Simon, yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, Senju. Great, great to see you again, yeah, Vitaly, and um, yeah. Um, nice to see you, uh, thank you for coming yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I actually moved to Japan like this, this summer, and then, um, yeah, I'm, I'm joining Dr. Yamasue on this uh, Hamamatsu school, and just to start the research here. Yeah, I got my own center now. <laughs> Congratulations, that's fantastic news. Uh, uh, so to, to all of us, um, I, I used to be in London in Berkeley College at the Center for Brain and Cognitive Development. I used to work with Mark Johnson for a while, who is now the head of Department of Psychology, I think, in Cambridge now. And then I just moved to Japan and to join some of the excellent autism research in here. Um, repatriated to my home country to restart some um, hopefully exciting line of autism research and other more developmental side of research as well. Great to see you. Okay, then uh, maybe I can ask some of our Trinity in Japan members. Or one, Chikako, do you like to introduce yourself? Chikako? Yes. Oh, yes, please. Yes, hello. <laughs> nice to see you. My name is Chikako Watanabe. I did PhD uh, in Trinity from 1990 till 95 or to 98 actually to when I took my degree. And um, it's in the field of astereology. Um, um, this is a, a really wonderful opportunity to understand autism because we have to deal with students with these uh, problems. So I look forward to it very much. Thank you. And I think, uh, yes, uh, Yasuhide Fukumoto Sensei, do you like to? Hello, yes. I, I was a vision fellow of Komona in 1996, and, and I worked with uh, Keith Moffat. Fluid mechanics. Yes, today I'm very curious about uh, this autism. Autism. Yeah, Fukumoto Sensei. He's one of our. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, Fukumoto Sensei is one of our regular members here, and he was he is a professor of mathematics at Kyushu University, which is one of the big, you know, uh, originally imperial universities, and he's also. I think director of the Industrial Mathematics Center. Uh, yeah, I, I worked uh, as a director for four years until 2018. Okay, and uh, maybe the last introduction we'll do here is Martin Morris. Martin, do you like to introduce yourself, Martin? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm. Uh, I was at Trinity 1976 to 1979 as an undergraduate, and I did architecture, and uh, I also took the um, diploma course there, and then came to Japan and uh, went for a doctorate at Tokyo University, looking at the development of Japanese traditional architecture, particularly the development of a house, and looking at um, the relationships between the house types of uh, different uh, social status uh, groups, basically, as they unfolded over time. Um, I've been teaching uh, history of architecture in the architecture department at Chibi University since 1996, and I'm due to retire from there next March, and thereafter probably retire to the United Kingdom, but we shall see. I'm very much looking forward to tonight's talk, um, because actually there have been and are around me um, one or two people with uh, or autistic children and um, to understand more about it would be something that I would really like to do. So uh, I look forward to this evening's talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all for coming. Maybe uh, one or two sentence, 
says, you know, I found a Trinity in Japan seven years ago, and I want to make the best out of it, whatever we can do, you know, in, in several different directions. And uh, one of them is, uh, uh, how do you say, in, in, increase the footprint of Trinity in Japan for corporations and also to give students a better chance if they look for a job in Japan, which several are. Some of our members are students and actually some of the Trinity students are here on our session today who currently work in Japan. And by having more Japan, a Trinity footprint in Japan, that will make the life of these students or fellows or you know, uh, uh, alumni in Japan more fruitful and more impactful. And so that's one of the purposes. I have several other purposes. So I'm always, you know, I'm trying to build up corporations with Trinity in Japan. And myself, I did my PhD at Trinity and I was a fellow for about 10 years. So I spent about 13 years of my life at Trinity, which is quite a big chunk of my life. So that's why I have big motivation to make the best out of Trinity in Japan. I think it's 1915 now. So Simon, uh, mm. it would be great. Shall we start? And uh, Maybe it would be fantastic at the beginning to hear, you know, you are now, you revolutionized uh, autism by uh, the way I understand it is I think you uh, made enormous impact in linking uh, psychology, which was a like couch type exercise into modern physics and genetics and modern scientific methods and you created a new concept of autism and it's just amazing uh, just you know I, I only scratch the surface of trying to understand what you have done so it would be fantastic if you start by explaining how you got there and why sure so um thank you very much Basil, for organizing these events for, and for inviting me to the trinity in japan series um, first of all, I should just say, I think it's fantastic what you're doing uh, because you're keeping Trinity College in Cambridge connected to the wider Trinity family, um, particularly in Japan. So um, welcome to everybody. Um, good evening in Japan. <coughs> good morning in Cambridge, England. Um, so your introduction is very kind, but it's, um, it's a slight exaggeration. There was uh, experimental psychology when I joined the field. Um, and over time, there has been more and more integration between psychology uh, and neuroscience, and then ultimately genetics. Um, and you'll hear today um, that my sort of modest contribution has been um, to look at the prenatal sex steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen because of the work that you'll hear about uh, of how these hormones change brain development um, to see if it's at all relevant to autism. Um, but in terms of my kind of career, um, I studied human sciences in Oxford as an undergrad. Um, after that, I went to work as a teacher in an autistic school. Uh, so this was, um, 1981, when there wasn't much known about autism. Today, autism is almost a household word. Everyone's heard of it. But back then, uh, if I said I was working with autistic kids, I would meet a kind of blank uh, facial expression. People didn't know what it was. Uh, um, and I was working in a small school, which was quite experimental, just to see what might help these kids. And I got fascinated and went on to do a PhD at UCL with um, a world expert in experimental psychology of autism, who is uh, Uta Frith. Um, and actually I've been working in autism research ever since. I've held lectureships in London at King's College London before moving to Cambridge in uh, 1994 and joining Trinity in 95. Um, and obviously Trinity is a wonderful uh, environment for science in particular, but for academic research um, and collegiality. So that's maybe enough about my career journey. Along the way, I trained as a clinical psychologist. So I, I have worked 
for part-time for one day a week in the National Health Service as a consultant clinical psychologist. I created a clinic for the late diagnosis of autism in adults at a time when uh, there was what we call a lost generation. People who may have needed a diagnosis of autism, but it wasn't very well recognized. And so they got right through their childhood and their teens without a diagnosis, but benefited from a late diagnosis. But my primary work is research and it's informed, I hope, by my clinical work. So if it's okay with you, I'll kick off with my please, presentation. Please, please. I'll, 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 I'll talk for about 45 minutes. Can you ask? Then, can I ask you one thing right before we start? You know, my sure. brother is a heart surgeon. He has done eight thousand heart operations and is currently building a very large hospital in China in cooperation with UCLA. And when I told him about your talk, I said, "Oh, you know, autism, this illness." You know, and he shot back, "Autism is not an illness." So, yeah. uh, what is your thought about that? Right at the, before you get started, you know, yeah, to put um, autism in the right context. Do you know what? Yeah, I'm sure. So, um, in, in terms of you. this by uh, uh, neurodiversity, which you mentioned. Yeah, right? exactly. So, um, I agree with your brother, um, and in my presentation, I'll I'll be touching on this question of how okay. should we how should we conceptualize autism. But you're right that in the US, and, and for a long time, autism was described as a disease. Or disorder, or, you know. Or a disorder. That's still the official name, autism spectrum disorder. Um, but there are other ways of looking at autism, including disability and difference, or what you were just touching on, uh, neurodiversity. So that's you're anticipating what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> so here we go let's just see if the slides are working um so let's just start with the kind of introduction about what is autism that the diagnosis is made on the basis of social and communication difficulties and also difficulties adjusting to unexpected change so these are children who like predictability and indeed adults who like predictability and they may get very stressed and anxious um, in situations that are not under their control. And that may link to the third feature, which is unusually narrow interests, sometimes called obsessions, that these uh, autistic people like to go into one topic in great depth, just like we do in research, but they do it right from childhood. They specialize, if you like, and they show unusually repetitive behavior. So you can see in this photo, we have a little boy and we'll talk more about how autism is diagnosed more often in boys than girls, but we have a little boy playing alone. So that's the social difficulties, but he's lining up his toy cars in a kind of repetitive fashion, creating patterns. And we'll talk a little bit about how autistic people have excellent pattern recognition skills. Uh, but, but a fourth characteristic that's only been added by the American Psychiatric Association since 2013 to the diagnosis, which is sensory hypersensitivity, that these are individuals who are very sensitive to sound, to light, to touch, maybe more sensitive than the average individual. So let's go straight to this word, Fazal, that you just mentioned, neurodiversity, because uh, many autistic people, especially those who have good language, good intelligence, are asking us to use this term in relation to autism. So neurodiversity simply means there is no one way for the brain to develop. There are many ways for the brain to develop. So we can't talk about a normal versus an abnormal brain. There are simply many routes in brain development. Um, each of those different types of brains brings with them both strengths and challenges. None of us are good at everything. Uh, but the concept of neurodiversity is that we should recognize different brain types as equal. 
One is not better or worse than another, they're simply different. So this may be the first um, way of thinking about autism, that autism is simply one example of neurodiversity. And the quote there is from Temple Grandin, who some of you will have heard of, who is a professor in the US um, who is herself autistic. But I wrote this article in about 2018 in Scientific American, uh, like an, uh, an op-ed piece entitled The Concept of Neurodiversity is Dividing the Autism Community. Some people believe in it and think that's the right way to think about autism, and other people insist that autism is a disease or a disorder. It's not simply a difference. So in some ways it's the medical model that autism is a disease or a disorder versus what's sometimes called the social model of just recognizing there is variation in the population, difference. And actually I'm going to argue that autism involves all four of these Ds, difference, that's diversity, disability, you don't get your diagnosis unless you're struggling in some area, disorder and disease, that's to say medical symptoms. And those of you who work in medicine know that the distinction between disorder and disease is where you have a medical condition where the mechanism is known, you call it a disease, and where it's unknown, you call it a disorder. And I think all four of these Ds apply. Uh, and we'll see examples of difference and disability as I talk, talk um, some more. But if you just look at this list of co-occurring conditions in autism, some autistic people have at least one, maybe several of these co-occurring conditions such as epilepsy, which is a good example of a disease, learning difficulties, a very good example of a disability. Um, I won't read all of them, gastrointestinal pain. So kids who, or adults who really experience um, very acute pain after they eat, um, which you could argue is a, a very clear example of a disorder uh, and so on. You can see many co-occurring conditions, language delay, clearly a sign of disability. Boring. You want to see Borat's brother? Does he look exactly the same? Only older. Uh, so um, thank you for the commentary. Uh, if you wanted to mute yourself whilst the talk is happening. I think you're, mom, you're, you're not muted. Thank you uh, for muting. And then I can continue. Um, Great, and you can see at the bottom of this list is mental health, that many autistic people have poor mental health, such as anxiety and depression. So in a second piece in Scientific American, I wrote another op-ed entitled, Is it time to give up on a single diagnostic label for autism? At the moment, we have an umbrella term from the American Psychiatric Association it's called autism spectrum disorder. In the UK, we just call it autism, but it's clearly it, in, it includes a lot of different types of autistic people with different kinds of co-occurring conditions. And maybe we need subgroups to make scientific progress, but also um, to be useful in terms of clinical services and support. So I mentioned earlier that autism is more common in boys. This is data from the Center for Disease Control in the States, uh, now quite old data, 2014, but more recent studies still show the same picture, that autism is about 1% of children, uh, and it occurs approximately four times more often in boys than girls. And you can see in this graph that it also shows variation in terms of IQ in both sexes. Some people have wondered whether the bias towards males um, in autism diagnosis reflects under diagnosis in females, that girls and women are simply not being identified by clinicians. 
And actually in recent years, more females have been seeking a diagnosis and the sex ratio may now be closer to three males for every one female, um, suggesting that maybe there was a misdiagnosis or underdiagnosis and uh, potentially something that researchers are calling camouflaging, that females with autism may be hiding their symptoms, perhaps because of social stigma, where there may be greater societal pressure on girls and women to appear sociable and communicative. But under the surface, these individuals are really struggling and often have high levels of anxiety. But nevertheless, even with improved diagnosis, there seems to be a bias towards males. And that's part of the rationale for why I started to explore sex steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen in terms of the etiology of autism, uh, because these hormones vary in quantity and uh, exposure in males and females prenatally. You can see here that girls tend to get their diagnosis later than boys, suggesting that they are indeed um, going undetected, maybe because they're hiding their autistic symptoms. So let's just turn now to the causes of autism. And I think this is the clearest way I can think of to summarize the major contributory factors to autism. The first is genetics, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the second circle in this Venn diagram is prenatal sex steroid hormones. And obviously I'll be talking about that. And that both of these prenatal biological factors impact on prenatal brain development. Um, and they probably affect boys, the, the male and female fetus differently to result in autism, such that even the autism itself may manifest differently in boys and girls. So the link between autism and sex or gender remains uh, very important. Let's talk about the genetics first. I'm glad we've got Shankar here today and uh, some of our colleagues in Japan who are geneticists. This slide shows you that there's been significant progress over the last 20 years in identifying what's called rare genetic variants um, using either whole exome sequencing uh, or whole genome sequencing more recently using Shankar's technology. Um, where there, there are now over 100 genes that are rare. That's to say in the general population, they occur in less than one in, in a thousand people, but they're more common in autistic people. So these genes are expressed in the brain. Uh, every time a new one is identified, it appears on a website called Safari-Gene. You can see it there, funded by the Simons Foundation, one of the major US donors, uh, philanthropists in autism research. So on the one hand, we can see evidence of strong genetic association with rare mutations, genetic mutations in autism. But we have to keep in mind that these are only seen in between five and 10% of autistic people. So they can't explain um, the other 90% of autistic people. These genes that we've just been talking about, I said they're expressed in the brain, but this study from just last year shows that they are expressed prenatally in the brain, showing that the onset of autism, or the, let's say the causes of autism are prenatal, even though the diagnosis is always postnatal in early infancy in the best case, but often, often not till childhood or even adulthood. You can see here that some of these rare genetic variants, uh, such as copy number variants, CNVs, duplications and deletions of genetic information are more common in girls than boys, 
reminding us that we have to we have to separate males and females when we're trying to understand uh, the causes of autism. But the other part of the genetic contribution to autism lies in common genetic variants. So these are genes that we all carry. They're common by definition, but these genes come in different uh, flavors, if you like. They're called polymorphisms. And depending on the type of polymorphism you carry, and indeed the combination of these that you carry, this might predispose you to autism. So what you're looking at here is something called a Manhattan plot because it resembles the skyline of Manhattan. And the red line um, is, is, sets the probability level for whether any of these common genetic variants might show a significant association with autism. And what you can see here is that there are just five little dots that cross the line. So these are common, five common genetic variants that show association with autism. This was published in 2019 in Nature Genetics and involved a very large sample, 18,000 autistic people, 28,000 non-autistic people. The reason you need big data to look at common genetic variants as many of you will know, is because each of these polymorphisms, these common variants, may play only a tiny role, may have only a tiny effect on making changes in the body and the brain. Um, so to identify a signal, you need big data. And actually, we thought back in 2019 that 18,000 people would have, would have been enough Probably it's not big enough as a sample size, uh, which is why they've only found five common genetic variants. And new research is now trying to have much bigger samples of autistic people, maybe 100,000 autistic people, to find more of the common genes associated with autism. But let's not get too hung up on, on genetics because. The existence of identical twins, like these two sisters, where one is autistic and one is not autistic, shows that autism cannot be 100% genetic. Um, identical twins share all of their genes. So if autism was just genetic, then if one of these monozygotic twins was autistic, the other one should be too. The fact that you can find they're called discordant twin pairs like these sisters, shows that autism must be partly environmental, that there might be environmental factors, including factors within the womb in pregnancy, which act on the genetic predisposition to change gene expression. And this is what's called epigenetics. And Shankar is a world expert in this field. And you can see that in this study published in 2013, but it's been replicated, looking at identical twins where one is autistic and one isn't, we see differences in gene expression, particularly around DNA methylation in a number of, of these genes, uh, suggesting that there are non-genetic factors, epigenetic factors also at play in autism. So now let's turn to the controversial area of sex differences in the general population, including in the brain. Controversial because some people want to argue that there are no differences between males and females in the brain or the mind. This data published in 2018 comes from a very big cohort. It's called the UK Biobank. So it's here in the UK funded uh, jointly between the Wellcome Trust and the Medical Research Council, where they have, uh, in this first data release, over 5,000 people who've had MRI scans, just looking at average sex differences, first of all, in total brain volume at the top of the graph, secondly, in gray matter, and third, at the bottom, in white matter in the brain. And you can see that there are small but statistically significant differences on average in each of these 
brain metrics in males and females. Um, and these differences persist after controlling for total volume, total surface area, cortical thickness, and height. So how does this relate to autism? Well, in this study we carried out back in 2013, we did um, a spatial overlap analysis. So what that is, is that we first, using MRI, uh, we first looked for which areas of the brain show differences between typical males and females, and then which areas of the brain show differences between autistic people and non-autistic people, and we looked for the overlap. And you can see in the red line that autistic females show a significant overlap in how they differ from non-autistic females in the areas that are related to sex differences or what's called sexual dimorphism. And it was in the direction of autistic females' brains uh, being more like a typical male brain. We know that sex differences in the typical brain are present very early in development, prenatally. This study in 2020 used fetal MRI, where you can use MRI whilst the woman is pregnant to look at the baby's brain. And they found uh, this one area in the inferior frontal gyrus shown in blue, which is larger on average in male fetuses than in female fetuses. I'm including this just because some people want to argue that any differences you find between males and females in the human brain may be the result of postnatal social experience. But the fact that we find some differences prenatally suggests that they may also, must also reflect prenatal biology. Let's switch back to autism because in this study from University of California in San Diego, they did a post-mortem study. And what they found was that the autistic brain has 65% more neurons or nerve cells in the frontal cortex, that region shown in green. So this is painstaking neuropathological uh, research, counting each individual nerve cell and finding that autistic brains have more nerve cells or neurons than the non-autistic brain. And we see evidence that the autistic brain is bigger across development. Again, this is MRI, looking at children from the age of 12 months through to 72 months of age. And you can see that the growth curve for autistic children is showing a bigger brain, total cerebral volume at every point on average compared to the typical brain. So those um, so, so the more neurons we saw at neuropathological post-mortem studies in autism is translating into a larger brain on average um, postnatally. And if we drill down deeper into the autistic brain at post-mortem to look at individual nerve cells, you can see on the right a neuron from an autistic brain and on the left a neuron from a typical brain. And even with the naked eye, I think you can see more of these white dots along the length of the, aut the autistic neuron. Each of those white dots is the location of a dendritic spine where a neuron forms a connection, uh, a synapse with its neighbor. So this is suggesting there are not only more neurons in the autistic brain, but also more connections between neurons in the autistic brain. And the graph in the center shows how these authors divided their sample very crudely into younger versus older. And they found that the autistic group, the dotted line, showed a less steep decline in the number of these dendritic spines with age, suggesting that in autism, there may be reduced apoptosis or selective cell death, which could account for why at post-mortem, post we see more neuronal connections in autism. There's just been 
less pruning, as it's called, in neuronal development. Back to sex differences, this quite old study from 1997 shows that there are typical sex differences on average between males and females. Males on average have um, 22 billion nerve cells, females on average 19 billion. And as we saw earlier, autistic people have even more than typical, uh, typical males. Let's turn to the psychology of autism because again, we see sex differences. In this very large study with 600,000 people without autism and 36,000 autistic people, it's an online study. They filled in a questionnaire called the empathy quotient to see um, how easily they can understand other people's thoughts and feelings. And what we found in this study was that there was a sex difference in the general population. So women shown in blue scored higher than uh, men shown in purple in the typical population on average, and that autistic males and females score significantly lower than typical individuals. In that same population, we were also able to give them a second questionnaire, which we called the systemizing quotient, which asks how interested you are in systems of one kind or another, mechanical systems, uh, biological systems, musical systems, mathematical systems, usually systems that follow rules or have patterns. And again, we see uh, a sex difference in the population that typical males in purple score higher than typical females shown in blue on average. And that this time autistic people score, both males and females score even higher than typical individuals. So we're seeing sex differences in both empathy and systemizing where autistic people are showing an extreme of the typical male profile. And if you want to just visualize that data, a lot of people, 600,000 people, um, males and females, you can see that the women are shown in yellow in the population, the men are shown in green in the population, and autistic people are shown in uh, pink and purple down here, and that they cluster into these different brain types. This is neurodiversity, depending on how they scored on empathy along the x-axis or systemizing along the y-axis. So autistic people, again, could be seen as an extreme of the typical male profile. And that can help explain autistic people like these two individuals. On the left is Derek Paravicini. He is autistic. He's also congenitally blind. Um, he can play any jazz song that he hears after hearing it just once. And, and if you ask him to transpose it into a new key, he can do it instantly. So he is showing excellent pattern recognition in terms of music. Music, of course, is a series of patterns. Um, but this is um, alongside his difficulties with social skills and communication. He also has a learning difficulty um, such that his mental age is equivalent to a three-year-old child. And on the right, you see Max Park, who is autistic, lives in California, and is the world champion in the Rubik Cube. Uh, obviously, the Rubik Cube is another system of rules. Uh, I call them if and then logical rules. But obviously, here we're talking about visual patterns rather than auditory patterns. So again, despite his difficulties with social skills and communication, he is showing excellent um, pattern recognition and systemizing. In that big population, 600,000 typical people, 36,000 autistic people, we were also able to look at autistic traits. So this is now ignoring whether you have a formal diagnosis and simply looking at whether you, where you score in terms of autistic traits. And 
The idea here is that we all have some autistic traits, and this was confirmed in the population. Uh, males, on average, in purple, have slightly more autistic traits than females in the population. And obviously, people with a diagnosis of autism have even more autistic traits. So we're seeing a link between autistic traits and your gender or sex, even in the general population. And we were able to look at the general population and divide them into those people who work in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, and those people who do not, and look at their autistic traits. And what we could see was that those working in STEM on average have more autistic traits than those who do not work in STEM. Again, suggesting a link between autism or autistic traits and an aptitude in pattern recognition or understanding systems. And we went on to look at this at the genetic level by working with the company 23andMe. Many of you will have heard of it. It's a personal genomics company because many of their customers donated a DNA sample using saliva, but also took the systemizing quotient so that we could look for any overlap or correlation between the common genetic variants associated with an aptitude in systemizing or pattern recognition and those identified in autism. And you can see there is indeed a significant correlation suggesting that the genes that contribute to autism are also associated with talent or aptitude in pattern recognition. And in my recent book, The Pattern Seekers, I argued that actually on this basis, the genes for autism have been contributing to the development, the evolution of human invention for at least 100,000 years. And if you look at just one example of human invention, the earliest musical instrument that has been found, which is a flute made from a hollow bone from a bird, it's about 40,000 years old. But if you analyze what was going on in the mind of the inventor to be able to create a system of this complexity, it's something like this, that if I blow down the hollow bone and cover one hole, then I make a particular sound. But if I blow down the hollow bone and cover two holes, then I make a different sound. So this if and then logic, uh, Boolean logic, um, I argue in the book, underlies all of human invention and is part of systemizing which, as we just saw, partly overlaps in its genetics with the genes for autism. Last couple of slides in terms of psychology, which is newborn babies. Um, we conducted this study uh, 20 years ago in Cambridge at the local maternity hospital to see whether newborn baby girls and boys showed a difference in their visual preferences. So we, sh we showed babies, they were 24 hours old, either a social stimulus, a human face, or a non-social stimulus, a geometric design. And what we found was that more girls than boys at birth looked longer at the human face, and more boys than girls at birth looked longer at the geometric design. Obviously, there were some babies who looked equally long at both, but we just coded those babies who diverged in their interests between the social and the non-social world. The fact that you find these differences as early as possible, 24 hours old, suggests that whatever the role of postnatal experience and culture in contributing to sex differences in the mind, prenatal biology must be playing a part. And back to autism, again, a study from University of California at San Diego found that toddlers coming to a clinic aged about 18 months old 
if you show them the social stimulus and the non-social stimulus, if a toddler looks for more than 70% of the time at the non-social stimulus, the probability that they end up with an autism diagnosis is 100%. So this is impressive as a behavioral test, although of course this, this was only on a clinic sample, but it also shows uh, a psychological profile in autistic infants, which is an extreme of the typical male visual preference. So let's get on now to prenatal sex steroids. We talked about genetics earlier, but this is the contribution that our group has made to autism research. Uh, we decided to look at these hormones, particularly as you can see here, testosterone and estrogen or estradiol, because of the work by Geshwind, Norman Geshwind um, in the 1980s, who was a neurologist who argued that these androgens and estrogens uh, masculinize the brain. What you're looking at here is the pathway that synthesizes these two sex steroid hormones. They start with cholesterol down to progesterone. And we were particularly interested in this pathway. It's called the Delta IV pathway, um, which ends up with testosterone and estrogen. Um, and Geshwin was very interested in this because of animal research at the time, suggesting that if you expose an animal to these hormones prenatally, these change the animal's brain development. And he called these organizational effects, which is another word for permanent effects, uh, changing brain development. At the time when he was doing his work, there wasn't an opportunity to study this in humans, but we um, have used a method called amniocentesis, where you can look at some of the fluid that surrounds the baby during pregnancy, the amniotic fluid. And in women who choose to have a clinical procedure called amniocentesis, where some of that fluid is extracted for clinical reasons, we can measure testosterone and estrogen prenatally at the time when it's having these organized organizational effects on brain development to see if it has anything to do with brain development, uh, autistic traits, and indeed autism. So what you can see is in our first studies, we were able to put children into the scanner whose mothers had had am amniocentesis and demonstrate in humans for the first time what we already knew from animal research, namely that there are areas of the brain that are correlated in volume with the exposure, the levels of prenatal testosterone. This is showing it in gray matter, for example. And some of these brain regions are very relevant um, to uh, social perception, like the right temporal parietal junction, um, RTPJ, or language such as the planum temporale. So this is just proof of principle that the hormones are associated prenatally with later brain development uh, in the child at aged eight. They're having long-term organizational effects. When these children were four years old, we were able to ask their parent to score the child in terms of autistic traits. And what we could see is a positive correlation. The higher the child's autistic traits um, were associated with higher levels of prenatal testosterone. Um, so in blue are the boys, in girls, in red are the girls. Obviously boys have more testosterone than girls on average. Uh, but even within each sex, we see a correlation between the amount of your level of prenatal testosterone and then four years later, how many autistic traits you have. But in order to test the link with autism, we turned for collaboration to the Danish biobank in Copenhagen because they've been storing amniotic fluid from amniocentesis in their freezers, in their biobank since the 1980s. 
and we were able to look at large samples linked to outcome in terms of diagnosis. And what we found was that autistic um, children um, had higher levels of prenatal testosterone and prenatal estrogens compared to typical males and females. How do these hormones work? Well, this cartoon gives you an idea of the consensus in the field in terms of uh, neuroendocrinology, that testosterone can enter the cell um, and once it's in the cell, it gets, it gets converted by the enzyme aromatase into estrogen, where it can bind to an estrogen receptor, which can enter the nucleus of the cell and bind to the DNA itself. So it's called a transcription factor because it changes gene expression and in particular is thought to have effects on that process I mentioned earlier, apoptosis or selective cell death or pruning. So there's a plausible mechanism from the molecular, the hormone, through to changes in brain structure and brain function in terms of apoptosis. You can see this very clearly in classic studies from the mouse from the 1970s, where if you take a mouse brain and you look at a region called the hypothalamus, and in particular, a region that differs between males and females called the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area, this would be a typical female mouse uh, brain area. And if you give her extra estrogen, this is what happens to that region of the brain. Many more neurons, many more connections between neurons, resembling now a typical male uh, brain region uh, in the mouse. So the hormone is having a clear causal effect um, on neuronal development in the mouse. Um, what we can see here also in a rodent model in rats is that if you give the pregnant mother rat a drug called letrozole, which blocks the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, so it causes a buildup of testosterone, so higher exposure for the baby. When you look at those the, the, the offspring um, and um, put them into two different situations, um, one where they can um, spend time with a conspecific, another rat or a model rat and or, or spending time alone, those uh, offspring that were given uh, the drug or the mothers were given a drug causing higher levels of testosterone um, show less um, of a preference for spending time with a fellow rat um, compared to a typical uh, rat who's untreated. So an animal model of the effects of elevated testosterone on social behavior in the offspring. And very recent work, which is not yet published from Cambridge, uh, from Madeleine Lancaster's lab using organoids, which are growing what, what are sometimes called mini brains in a, in a dish, uh, using the newest technology for modeling brain development. You can see that if you, um, if you give um, an androgen, a potent androgen, it's called DHT, uh, if you administer it to these organoid systems, you see a significant increase in excitatory neural precursors in the brain de in brain development. This is obviously in a model system, but it's a human model system, again demonstrating that androgens and estrogens change brain structure. I'm almost at the end of my presentation, but I want to just address the question of, in autism, what is the source of the elevated prenatal sex steroids? Uh, it could, of course, be coming from the baby, but the other possibility is it's coming from the mother, because the mother has her own sex steroid hormones. And you can see in this Chinese study 
from 2015, they simply took blood samples during pregnancy and found that mothers of children who later were diagnosed with autism had higher levels of testosterone in their serum samples um, from blood um, compared to um, mothers of typical children. So this suggests that we need to look at the mother's hormonal profile because her hormones can cross the placenta and um, influence the baby's brain development, not just look at, at the baby's hormonal status. And a final clue that the mother is contributing comes from these studies of a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS, that what's been found now in four different studies across the world is that women with polycystic ovary syndrome, which involves elevated prenatal sex steroids, have a significantly higher likelihood of having a child with autism compared to typical women. So it's, if you like, a medical condition that serves as a natural experiment to see the effects of exposure on the baby of elevated prenatal sex steroid hormones. So I'm going to wrap up and conclude with this uh, graphic to say that what we've learned over the last 20 or 30 years is that um, genetics plays a key role in autism. So that's shown up here in the top left-hand schematic, but so do prenatal hormones. And I've arranged this graphic in terms of pregnancy, so trimesters of pregnancy, because as these hormones surge, uh, estrogen and testosterone, particularly in males. Uh, here you can see the testosterone levels in females remain much lower in the, in the female baby, but in the male baby, they really surge prenatally, that genetics and hormones are interacting to change brain development to influence the likelihood of autism as an outcome. So it's a gene-hormone interaction, and I've shown in particular here the placenta because the new area of research is to examine the contribution of the placenta in, be, simply because the placenta synthesizes its own sex steroid hormones. And so that could be a third possible source of the elevated uh, sex steroid hormones um, in early development. I want to thank a lot of collaborators the work I've been telling you about is the result of teams, and many of them have either worked on understanding typical sex differences or understanding the role of genetics and prenatal sex steroids in autism. And I want to thank our funders, um, and we can stop for questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so very much, Simon. This was absolutely fantastic. And uh, what I thought is, Shanka, if you have a question, and maybe you can kick off the discussion, uh, because you are so, well, A, close together geographically and great friends, and uh, I think you, you have a lot to say here. I'm very happy to kick off. Uh, we would just like to start by um, really showing my appreciation to Simon for what he has done for millions of people. I think his, his, his contributions, the, the, the <coughs> less scientific contributions of, of bringing awareness and understanding to the wider global public, as well as establishing methods for diagnosis, uh, which has led to you know, methods to help people struggling with social difficulties, you know, has, has literally changed the lives of, of, of millions of people, including people who are very dear to me. So um, I think it's very rare um, to have um, someone in academia affect so many lives. So we'd like to thank him um, for, for all of that. 
um, I, I think bringing together um, psychology and, and metrics, measurable science and, and mechanism is a very challenging uh, interface and um, for, for anyone. And um, again, I think uh, what Simon has done along with um, some of the others he's mentioned in the field is, is, is exactly that, uh, bringing this, this hard uh, physical science edge to something that's inherently uh, complex. Uh, some people call it soft. Uh, it's, it's not really soft, it's just very complicated. And uh, I think it's it's tremendous to uh, to see the progress there. So uh, congratulations on all of that, Simon. Uh, you know, on on so many levels. Um, so I I have lots of questions. I always do, and often get together with Simon to, to ask many of them. Um, what one one thing that I, I'm not aware of, and it's 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 a question and or a suggestion, and that is. Um, we live in an era where um, it's possible to do prenatal blood-based testing of fetal DNA from blood samples. And Dennis Lowe in Hong Kong is, is, is the pioneer of, of all this work. And, and it's, it's possible to do genetic and epigenetic analysis of cell-free fetal DNA. And of course you can from the epigenetic patterns, you can you can identify you can separate the fetal fragments of DNA from the maternal fragments of DNA and disambiguate that. Uh, which which means you you can actually uh, do prenatal profiling of the genetics and the epigenetics. And I, I just wondered, um, Simon, if. If, if you're aware of if you're doing that or if anyone else is doing that because it, it struck me you know, everything you said leads to prenatal causation mm -hmm. and there is a genetic component that's difficult to find but it's real and there's an environmental component that will manifest at some level in the epigenetics so it, it struck me that that might be a very good approach to use in a, a cohort type study. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would be surprised if some of the cohorts you mentioned, the biobanks and so forth, that they may well have also um, banked some blood samples or um, blood, blood derived uh, plasma cell-free DNA samples. Because this sort of thing, of course, it's being done a lot in the oncology space now, and um, for, for the also for the better characterized uh, prenatal um, testing conditions. So, just uh, wondered if that's something that might mm. be worth. Doing. Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, thank you, Shankar, for those kind words. Um, uh, obviously, today I was mostly talking about. Um, about the prenatal biology of autism and, and its links to the psychology of autism. But you're right that some of our work is also um, more clinical and more um, real world to do with uh, setting up diagnostic services and um, through our charity actually, we're campaigning for much better services, support services for autistic people. But to your question, it's a really interesting question. So fetal DNA and um, separating it from maternal DNA. Um, I'm not aware of anyone looking at this in autism research yet, but it could be that some of our colleagues uh, in Japan are aware of some of this. Um, I need to uh, just check that presumably this can be done um, from a blood sample from the mother um, during pregnancy, yes. is that right? So, right. so we're work, so we're working with um, a Norwegian uh, biobank. It's called MOBA, which is the mother and baby cohort, um, where they have thousands of uh, of blood samples taken during pregnancy from women in the population, and they can link them to whether the baby their baby went on to receive a diagnosis of autism. So. This, the experiment could be done. Uh, maybe it is being done in other labs and I'm just unaware of it. Um, 
I would I'd want to flag up a sort of ethical issue around prenatal testing, just because I know that this uh, this seminar is being recorded, and I know that um, some people will be quite concerned about what is what is the reason why scientists are, are, are doing prenatal biology, are, are studying pre prenatal biology and autism, and in particular, is it is this research going to be used to develop a prenatal test for autism? And uh, some autistic people are very threatened by that idea because it could be a form of eugenics. So I just want to sort of separate the question that's of great scientific interest that you raise. I think it should be, should be studied so that we have a better understanding of um, the fetal DNA Contrib contribution to autism, and including, as you outlined, changes in um, in gene expression in fetal genes prenatally. We need to understand this just to um, to understand autism itself. But how that research should be used, the application of that research needs really careful bioethical discussion uh, because of what's happened, for example, in a different area which is down syndrome obviously the genetics is much uh, more straightforward than in autism but whether it did lead to prenatal testing towards termination of pregnancies and so these ethical issues are, are real and i'm just flagging them thank you simon oh, if I, uh, simon if i may ask you a question uh, it's really the kind of uh, logic from uh, evolution you know, Matthew Walker has written a book on, on sleep, and he writes that there apparently are two types of people in terms of sleep patterns. There are some people who go to bed early and wake up early, and then there are others who go to bed late and wake up late. And that seems to be genetic. And he argues that this comes from, you know, a very long time ago when people were living in caves and you needed uh, you know, uh, shifts in sleeping where one shift of people would um, be, uh, you know, going, uh, uh, carrying on the watch, uh, you know, against lions and attackers uh, until, let's say, midnight. And then the other shift would take over between uh, uh, midnight and, uh, and early morning. And this apparently is still encoded in our genes. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is true, you know, but he writes it in the book where you know, these prehistoric, long ago patterns of life are carried through. So my question to you is, um, since uh, I think you argue that in many of your talks and books and articles, that there's a big uh, genetic and, uh, and evolutionary uh, cause for you know, the spectrum of autistic, uh, you know, just not one autism, but the whole spectrum. Yeah. So yeah. How deep is this logic and what was, these uh, um, uh, 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 autistic traits, what is, yeah. why were they needed all through the evolution? You know, why did, uh, you know, why did evolution create these patterns? Yeah. Um, so, you know, genes, um, genes have been around a long time. <coughs> the, human, the human genome isn't recent, uh, including mono, mo modern homo sapiens. Um, I showed you some evidence in the talk today for uh, a correlation between the, the common genetic variants associated with um, pattern recognition mm -hmm. um, or talent in systemizing mm -hmm. and the common genetic variants associated with autism. Mm -hmm. And in all likelihood, you know, these genes, this, this correlation isn't new. Mm -hmm. um, genes don't change that much. Um, and in my book, I argue for an evolutionary account um, that, that the, some of the genes associated with autism may have contributed to the evolution of um, invention. I gave you the example of the first musical instrument, but between 70,000 and 100,000 years ago, we see a big change in the rate of human invention compared to any other species at the time or since. Um, so we see sculptures, we see cave paintings, we see 
complex weapons like the bow and arrow. We see the creation of jewelry, uh, and obviously through to um, other, other complex tools, all of which seem to rest on good pattern recognition and this logic that I described, the if and then logic. Um, and we still see that link today. I showed you the link between autistic traits and those working in STEM. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, we found in family studies that uh, parents of autistic children are more likely to be working in fields like engineering. Yeah, you showed this so, Eindhoven study. The Eindhoven study I didn't include today, but showing that autism rates are twice as high in the city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands, which is kind of like Silicon Valley in Europe, um, where people for over 100 years have moved to work either in the Philips factory there or at the Institute of Technology there. So these are kind of clues for a link between some of the genes that contribute to autism and some of the genes that contribute to the very uniquely human ability to invent or understand systems. Uh, obviously, evolutionary theories are difficult to prove. The one you gave about um, sleep, you know, how can we really know that it was to do with the two different types of sleep patterns in people keeping watch in the caves? That part is speculative. Um, but we can certainly, uh, we, we, need to, we need to look at which genes have been conserved across, across evolution uh, in the human case, in the modern human case, and, uh, and then look for contemporary evidence which is testable. Maybe uh, I want to introduce my brother Roland, because uh, Roland, 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 I, uh, Roland, I don't know, he, he seems to not react. Roland, are you here? Yeah. Hi. Okay, uh, this is my brother Roland, yeah? And when I told Roland about your talk today, <coughs> you know, I didn't know as much about autism. I didn't even know nothing about autism really, you know? So I, I told my brother Roland about uh, your talk today. And I said, you are going to talk about the autism disorder or illness, you know? And my brother shot back, it's not an illness, you know? And my brother is actually a heart surgeon and he's done about 8,000 heart operations and he's building up heart hospitals. He's, build, he's now building up his, I think, sixth hospital, which is in cooperation with University of California, Los Angeles and in China. And he's hiring like 1,000 doctors building up a big, big private hospital in China. So Roland, do you have any questions? <laughs> Oh my God! I mean, I'm I'm only a cardiac surgeon. <laughs> I I, uh, I mean, I <coughs> a question to autism. <laughs> I have to quit. I mean, okay. I, I well, Roland. I just want to say it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Um, thank thank you for coming today. Um, you know, uh to make a, a speculative connection with your own field, we are now looking at the link between autism and co-occurring medical conditions, some of which have a hormonal component, and that can include cardiovascular disease. Um, so part of our new research through a, a PhD student in Cambridge is looking at the rate of cancers, some of which have a hormonal component, but also the cardiovascular disease, which, which does too. Um, I didn't talk about it in today's talk, but where we are finding elevated prenatal sex steroids, they may not just be affecting the brain, they may be affecting the whole body. And we might see that played out <laughs> in their medical profile, in, the, in their physical health. Yeah. I mean, I must say, uh... I've never been in pediatric cardiac surgery. I, from the beginning, always was in adult cardiac surgery. So I'm only the short time I've been involved in pediatrics, I did see that whatever cardiac disease you have, there are multi many other genetical things involved. And it's not, it's not only the heart, it's a multifactorial issue. And, and so, but what yeah. we do see currently is a decline in these numbers because uh, 
uh, a high number of these babies with multifactorial diseases and genetic problems don't live up to the time of birth because these pregnancies are more and more terminated, not only here, but everywhere around the world. So we see a decline in these numbers, actually. Yeah. Which goes back to your ethics issues. I'm yeah, well, absolutely. That's a different thing. Yeah. Can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, yeah, who is that? Oh, yeah. Um... Oh, of course <laughs> you can. Please, please. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Please oh, yeah. uh, introduce uh, by introducing yourself brief, briefly, okay? Okay, um, I'm Antonio Park. I'm uh, currently in Cambridge doing a PhD in uh, chemical engineering department. So my research is basically about um, numerical, numerical ordinary differential equation solver <laughs> for our chemical engineering uh, equations. So um, it's more of a math and uh, algorithms, yeah. So um, yeah, I'm I'm not um, I'm not a biology you know uh, stuff expert. So my question can be a bit crude. So uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Thank uh, yeah. Firstly, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was really uh, interesting and inspiring to me because um, I you know I heard the autism for the first time in Cambridge when we are discussing about. Um, you know, when, when my friends and I were having a conversation in CMS, uh, there's a, you know, mathematical building, and then there's a autism uh, experiment, um, volunteers, and then there was the first time I heard of autism, and then I, later then, uh, yeah, later that day, I tried to, um, yeah, get, get, get the feel for it. So, yeah, the first question is, um, in, in the slides, there was a, a experiment that you introduced in from the 1980s that uh, the scientists were counting the number of brain cells. So how, how which method uh, did they use to count up 10 to uh, nine? Yeah, order of that order of magnitude. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's um, very careful neuropathology. In terms of the, the precise method, I would have to refer you to the original study. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm not a neuropathologist myself, uh, but um, uh, I can send you the paper if you like. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, the uh, second question is um, when uh, where is it? Um, you talked about the M amniotic fluid, and then there's a hormonal um, analysis from, uh, I, I think you did the, uh, um, what was it? Amniotic fluid, and then there's a, uh, you analyze the uh, hormonal concentration from the amniotic uh, fluid, exactly. I think. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, correct. Yeah, from the pregnant woman. And then you were talking about the, um, for those patients uh, who actually needed to uh, take the fluid out, was it? Yeah, so, so then we were using um, a clinical procedure called amniocentesis. Oh, it's, okay, it's, yeah. been, it's been around since about the 1990s. Um, and it's been used a lot for um, looking at the likelihood of the baby having Down syndrome. So you take the fluid using a long needle mm, from, okay. the pregnant, from the pregnant woman. Um, and and the, you look for the presence of uh, chromosomes, chromosomal abnormalities, in particular in the case of Down syndrome, uh, trisomy, so an extra chromosome 21, as a, a prenatal test for Down syndrome. In our, in our studies, when women were having this test anyway, we were asking them for their consent to analyze the same fluid for hormonal concentrations. Uh, and we worked with the biochemistry department at the local hospital, Adambrooks, where you can assay the testosterone levels uh, using a, an ELISA method, it's called. Okay. Um, so in fact, amniocentesis is being phased out of clinical practice. So repeating those experiments is going to be 
um, quite challenging. It's not, um, it's probably not ethical to, mm. to do these experiments purely for scientific reasons, because amniocentesis carries a small risk of causing miscarriage. But we were studying, we were able to look at the amniotic fluid because it was being collected anyway okay. in the hospitals. So usually it's just thrown away, but we asked the woman if we could analyze it for this uh, scientific question. And of course, it's always with consent. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering the, the exact techniques that you used. Uh, I mean, that, uh, you know, how to get the uh, fluids out and then, yeah. yeah. So, okay. so as, I as I mentioned, the obstetrician will use a long needle, which, go which goes through the abdomen into the, uh, into the womb. And uh, uh, it's, it's guided by ultrasound to make sure that the needle doesn't go anywhere close to the fetus because of the risk. Um, so uh, it gives you some idea anyway of the methods used. Okay. So next, I was thinking, uh, 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 Hyun, is that okay? Uh, Hyun Park. Yep. It's uh, okay. Uh, okay. So I would like to ask uh, Professor Ozumi, do you have some questions because you are uh, directly working in this field? Uh, actually, so I'm working on the, what to say, as uh, a mechanism. So which means that so I'm using uh, the rodent as a model. So, um, but I'm so much interested in the, uh, nowadays in the gender difference in brain development. And actually, so we have some uh, preliminary uh, uh, unpublished data that in the very early stage of the uh, brain development, the gene expression profiles are already a little bit different from the, uh, between the male and the female. So I thought that, which is very interesting because that it is far from the, uh, the exposure of the, the testosterone. Uh, it's, it's just uh, like uh, in the middle of uh, the gestation in the mouse breast development. So I thought that it is far uh, earlier than the classical or the uh, textbook idea of the uh, testosterone exposure to uh, become the, the di uh, different, uh, the, the sex different uh, differential brains. But I, so in the one slide you showed us that the exposure, uh, the, how to say, the testosterone level is, uh, how to say, um, a little bit increase as a mid gestation stage. So yes, if exactly. it is, oh really, so if it is true, so maybe the stage I we have analyzed is already uh, exposed to the, how to say the sex hormones, especially yeah. the testosterone. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, but anyway, yeah. so they, yeah. So, but uh, actually, so we have so much interest in the, uh, the sex difference. And, uh, and uh, another thing is that I, we thought that we believe that uh, so the, in the case of the female patient, I'm not a clinician, but uh, so I thought that from the textbook that female uh, the autistic people are more, uh, how to say, dominated in the uh, low IQ type rather than the, how to say, high IQ type. So I thought that so the difference between the male and female in the, uh, the sex, uh, the ratio, and also the phenotype, also the autistic, uh, the boys and girls can be mm -hmm. uh, segregated by that way. But uh, in, uh, in your the introduction slide, so there's not so much difference between uh, kinds of ratio uh, dividing in, in using the IQ scores. Yes. Okay. So. I'm a little uh, so, bit confused. No, no, that's good. So mm -hmm. thank you for both of those questions. Yeah. Um, so if I can just first of all respond to the first question, yes. which is about um, about the changes in prenatal uh, testosterone production mm -hmm. during during pregnancy during gestation. Right. Right. So in, in the in the human case, 
in, in with male pregnancies, mm -hmm. there is a, a spike in the production of testosterone between mm -hmm. about 12 weeks and 20 weeks of pregnancy. So in it's humans. towards in humans. So okay. so so toward, towards the end of the first trimester and into the second trimester, um, there's a kind of increase in um, in testosterone production uh, from the fetus because testosterone comes from the testes. Yes. So the male baby has has testes, um, but also there are other sources. I mentioned the placenta. Uh, in females, the mm -hmm. testosterone is coming from the adrenal glands, but mm -hmm. in the female baby, it's at a lower level across mm -hmm. gestation in humans. You you talked about rodents, so I don't yes. know. I don't know what the equivalent is, the window in development is, but in they, but the research talks about the masculinizing programming window, the MPW, both mm -hmm. in rodents and in humans and other species, um, that as you have this surge in production of testosterone prenatally, it's changing the body, it's masculinizing the body and the brain. Yeah. Uh, from the default, which is their sort of feminine um, mm. phenotype, if you like. Mm -hmm. So depends depends what the equivalent is in rats. Uh, as uh, you know, you have to you have to look at um, really in a lot of detail at um, the point in development when you're measuring the hormones right. to know if you're in to know if you're in that peak or just yeah. before it or just after it. I um, see. Amniocentesis by coincidence, happens right in that peak between mm -hmm. 12 and 20 weeks in the human case in pregnancy. But your other question is about autistic females mm -hmm. and the link with IQ. I yes. think it's true that in the, I think in the older studies, um, it seemed as if, uh, if autistic, as if girls got a diagnosis of autism, they were also more likely to have learning difficulties. Right. Or below average IQ. I think right. that's changed. I think that's changed. In oh, the really? in, in the more recent prevalent studies, more mm -hmm. girls and women are being diagnosed who have no learning difficulty. So mm -hmm. average IQ or above. So I think the link between autism in females and IQ is no longer so um so clear or mm. so so different. Okay. So I need to be updated. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Osumi. Uh, uh, Professor Sadato, you are next on my uh, window here. If you like to have a question, please. And maybe you can again introduce yourself also kind of, uh, briefly, what you do. Sure. Uh, the, I've been working on the, uh, the uh, neural mechanism of the, uh, the the so-called social interaction using the hyperscaling fMRI. So <laughs> before, at the, at the, I'm interested in the SD as the, at the, at the communication disorders. And the, today's talk is quite at the, at the interesting that the, at the uh, autistic trait appears to be at the, characterized by the higher at uh, the pattern recognition with uh, at the some at uh, the at, uh, at the compensation for the uh, the social at uh, the disabilities i'd like to know Otto, what the causal relationship between these two traits but actually if one person is better for the system at uh, system at the uh, uh, the levels. On the other hand, uh, at the, he is not so good at social communication. And uh, the, there is no uh, the, uh, the, uh, superiority on the both traits. Therefore, there may be some at the, at the interaction between them. The, at the system level hyper activities and the, uh, the deteriorated social communications. This is just a epiphenomenon, or is there any causal relationship? But, uh, this is my uh, two questions. And uh, sure. uh, so thank you very much for 
for coming today and for your uh, questions. First of all, hyper hyper scanning is very exciting. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, but you've mentioned it in the, in your introduction, it's where you have two people in uh, separate MRI scanners, right. but where you can look at um, the relationship between their brains, their brain activity, um, uh, either whilst whilst they're communicating or whilst they're uh, in in some in some way interacting, yeah. um, and it's I think it's a it's a, a really exciting area of neuroscience, and actually would be very relevant to autism. I'm not sure if there's any hyper scanning studies of uh, autistic people yet. Maybe you know of some. Yes. Um, but yeah. Uh, uh uh, actually, uh, uh, several years ago, uh, we did the hyper scanning of uh, two persons. One is uh, uh, the ASD, and the others are uh, uh, the normal development. But right. the, usually, the two persons are doing the so called joint attention task. Yeah. Then they will do have uh, some synchronization of their brain, particularly in the right anterior insular area, just extending okay. the inferior frontal gyrus. It right. is a right. specific area. But uh, if the autistic people and uh, normal the persons are interaction, uh, interacting for the joint attention, these synchronization just disappeared. Right. And, uh, 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 this has mm. been just uh, the interpreted as the sharing of the predictions of the other persons during the joint yeah. event. Yeah, well, that's really, really exciting to hear this research. Um, so, you know, 25 or 30 years ago, I was looking at joint attention in autism just at the behavioral level, mm -hmm. but now you're able to study it um, whilst doing simultaneous imaging of two, two individuals sharing a focus of attention to study it at the neuroscientific level and that's that's um, really wonderful research uh, if i could just quickly turn to your second question mm -hmm. which is about the relationship between empathy and systemizing mm -hmm. i think that was you know what you were asking mm -hmm. because autistic people obviously have um at least average if not superior systemizing but they have below average scores on the tests of empathy mm -hmm. particularly cognitive empathy which is sometimes called theory of mind or imagining other people's thoughts and feelings um, so in the general population we find these two dimensions are not completely independent there's a small but significant inverse correlation mm -hmm. so the better your systemizing the, the worse your empathy and vice versa. And bringing this back to the topic of today's lecture, mm -hmm. in our studies of um, prenatal testosterone, we found the higher your prenatal testosterone, the better you are at systemizing, mm -hmm. yeah. but also the higher your prenatal testosterone, the lower your scores in empathy. So interestingly, these two psychological dimensions seem to relate to a single biological mechanism, which is the prenatal androgens or testosterone. Um, and we might wonder whether going back to um, Gerhard's question on evolutionary significance, you know, did evolution um, create or natural selection create a pressure mm -hmm. on individuals to specialize either towards systems mm -hmm. or towards people mm -hmm. uh, and through through a common biological mechanism which is the prenatal sex steroid hormones mm -hmm. that there might be some evolutionary advantages to brains that specialize either in understanding the, the world of objects mm -hmm. uh, or the world of people um, rather than just being equally good at both mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we see this in the general population so these are these are um, differences individual differences in the general population 
leaving aside autism. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, if we maybe next week could go to Professor Yamasue, if you like, you are kind of next on my screen here. If you uh, like to ask a question and maybe start by introducing yourself briefly. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm. Uh, I have a really interesting in the uh, theory of uh, by uh, Simon Simon. Uh, extreme air brain theory of autism uh, and uh, I have conducted uh, mainly uh, oxytocin research so uh, sex difference in oxytocin and sex difference in social behavior and social brain development and uh, related relation to uh, autism uh, so uh, I have really uh, interested in your story Simon and uh, I have a question. Uh, um, if uh, more uh, excess uh, testosterone uh, make uh, higher autistic trait or uh, low social cognition, uh, maybe uh, in uh, typical de development, uh, such excess, uh, such uh, secretion of testosterone. Uh, have uh, normal functions such as uh, uh, growth of uh, sexual uh, behavior or sexual organ. So uh, if so, uh, some autistic people uh, has uh, some uh, physical uh, characteristics um, derived from uh, excess uh, testosterone in uh, fetal status. Uh, yeah. Do you know some such uh, evidence for a physical effect of excess testosterone in autistic people? Um, yes, yeah, so that's very interesting. Um, there's some work in Australia mm. uh, by um, Diana, um, I think her last name is uh, Tang, but I can check the, but what she's looking at is, is facial morphology so there are typical sex differences in the structure of the human face mm. on average between males and females and she's looked at um uh first of all in autism whether autistic people are more likely to have a masculinized facial structure mm. irrespective of their sex mm. and there are different landmarks on the face where you that you can use to uh, to uh, measure um, face, more, more masculine or more feminine facial characteristics. So I think she's also in her work, this is the lab of Andrew Whitehouse in Australia. Uh, they've also related it to um, certainly neonatal testosterone um, uh, measured from the umbilical cord at birth, but maybe they also have proxy measures for, for prenatal testosterone. Um, so I think you're absolutely right that this prenatal sex steroid theory of autism, mm. it was put forward to understand uh, differences in the brain, which could result in differences in behavior in autistic people and might help to explain why autism is diagnosed more often in boys. Uh, but we would expect it to also have an impact on other systems in the body. So, for example, autistic women are more likely to have that condition called polycystic ovary syndrome, mm. which is caused by elevated prenatal testosterone and which is characterized by irregular menstrual cycles, uh, excess bodily hair or hirsutism, um, and uh, late onset of menarche. So when the girl reports the, the age of, of first menstruation, these are all later or uh, at elevated levels in autistic females. So um, I think this, we're just at the beginning of looking at what is the impact of, the, of different hormonal status, maybe hormonal dysregulation in autistic men and women, boys and girls, 
uh, across the whole body, not just uh, in the brain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great. Maybe uh, Professor Senju, I think you didn't have a question yet. Do you like to ask? Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, yes, uh, this is great, great as, as always. And yeah, Sam, I, I'm happy to see that because um, you talk about uh, and, uh, male female brains are always great, but um, I'm also see that I'm happy to see that you are kind of tag, tackling head on this uh, question about neurodiversity and possibly dividing autism communities. And because I think you are the one who opened the floodgate by cre creating AQ and then like opening like a whole bunch of research questions about autistic trait within the neurotypical population. And so, and my question is because now you are talking about uh, 4Ds and this, and then, but I think the biggest question is that this, uh, the boundary between disability and disorder is quite broad and people have different opinion on it. And now I moved to the medical school and people are really talking about what is the treatment and what is the in possible intervention to autistic core symptoms. So do you have any opinion on what I can, what is your, I can view on neurodiversity and the integration put on this like a medical stance on autistic people? Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you're bringing the discussion back to neurodiversity. This was, <laughs> we started this at the beginning of the lecture and as we're reaching the end of the session, it's good to come back to this point because the whole point about neurodiversity is it doesn't necessarily need treatment. Let's take a very simple example of being left-handed or right-handed. We know that this is part of neurodiversity. About 12% of males are left-handed in the population. About 8% of females are left-handed. It doesn't mean that they need their left-handedness treated. We just need to accept that, pe that, that brains develop differently under the control of genetic mechanisms, prenatal hormone mechanisms, uh, and the whole concept of diversity. We're very familiar with it in terms of gender diversity, ethnic diversity. It's all about acceptance and respect for difference and treating diverse, uh, diversity in the population as equal. One doesn't need treatment and the other one doesn't. Um, so, however, when we think about autism, not just in terms of neurodiversity, but also in terms of disability, I, I talked about the four Ds. I think there is obviously a case for intervention. When someone has a disability, uh, they are entitled by law to support, and that support could be an intervention. For example, speech therapy, if the child is slow to develop language, um, occupational therapy, if the child has motor difficulties or movement difficulties, uh, it could be social skills training or teaching if the child has social skills difficulties. And obviously this has to be at the, at the um, choice of the parents when it comes to children. And for the adult, they should choose if they want intervention. Um, and we all take different kinds of intervention, you know. And then of course, when we think about the aspects of autism that may be medical conditions like epilepsy, gastrointestinal pain, clearly we hope there will be even better pharmacological treatments for these kinds of symptoms because um, this isn't about diversity. These are diseases and disorders which are causing suffering or pain. And obviously the, um, the uh, obligation on medical research and clinical practice is to reduce suffering. So we need treatments to be available, and then it's up to individuals if they want to take them. Does that answer your question? Yes, um, yes, uh, um, in mostly, because um, I, I totally agree that it has to be a choice by individual, but um, I think still like many biomedical research 
is focusing on the root cause of autism and possible intervention on the root cause, which obviously have a huge backlash from the neurodiversity communities. And I, I think that, that is where, where the, the tension is highest. And, and yeah, yeah. You, yeah. So, okay, so I, um, this is very important also to talk about that, um, you know, we can divide research, autism research into basic science, looking at causes, and applied research, which is looking at um, what kind of support people need. And my view is we need both kinds of research. Uh, some autistic people are certainly questioning whether there should be so much money spent on finding the genetic basis of autism, for example, um, when it may not lead to anything useful in their lifetime. Um, I think, you know, it's not really that we should be supporting one kind of research or, or the other. I think we should be supporting both kinds of research. Clearly, there's a need for more clinical research, real world research that will demonstrate uh, which interventions are most useful, most effective for autistic people. And even more important, we need more funding for services, for support services. For autistic people. I know in, in this country, you know the situation from when you were in London, that people have to wait for over a year to get their diagnosis. So even though we have a national health service here, I think like you have in Japan, uh, the delays in getting um, to see a, a specialist um, are really great. So there are real barriers. And, that's, and the lack of support, even if you get a diagnosis, is very real. And that could be causing the very poor mental health in autistic people. So, um, and we know that even in adults, something like 85% of autistic adults are unemployed, despite the fact that they often have good skills, they are employable. So there's a lack of support including supported employment or help to get work, which by itself can be causing poor mental health. So I'm very glad that we're kind of finishing the discussion uh, just in terms of what is it like in the real world for autistic people and their families. Research is all very well. And obviously as a scientist, um, this is what we want to advance. But, but we also need to be campaigning for better support, more funding for autistic people's lives and their families. Yeah, I, I've seen, Simon, that you are supporting a company which employs only the autistic people uh, and uh, using their special skills and gifts. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, a scientific advisor to a company called Auticon. Uh, it started in Germany, but it's, uh, it's actually in half a dozen different European countries now and also in the US, um, maybe in Japan, I'm not sure. Um, but they only employ autistic people who have good coding skills and they offer them a job for life as consultants. And then they, um, you know, they place their autistic consultants, hence the name of the company, Auticon, into different companies like Deutsche Bank and so forth. Um, and they provide support whilst the person is working. So we know that many autistic people, even after they have a job, need continuing support because uh, there can be unexpected stresses and challenges. And uh, these are reasonable adjustments for somebody with a disability. Uh, I'm using that term reasonable adjustments carefully because it's a legal term that certainly in the UK, um, the term reasonable adjustments is in the Equality Act that anyone with a disability, both at school and at work, need, is, deserves reasonable adjustments for their disability. Otherwise, it's discrimination. Well, I think we are coming to the end. You told me that this is about the time you have your next uh, plans. 
So thank you so very, very much, Simon. This was absolutely fantastic. And what I find so very, very impressive is that you can combine on one hand the scientific progress and on the other hand, helping people who uh, are different than us. Uh, uh, that's the wrong way to put it. But I mean, the way you describe it is there's like a, a distribution of neurological makeups and every one of us finds itself on some position in this on in a field of compositions of this mental makeups and just because somebody is in a different spot on this uh, 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 field of makeups doesn't mean that that person is better or less but it means that you know they do some things differently and need uh, like you say uh, help and assistance and and it's fantastic that you are so productive and active in in these uh, different areas in helping people who need the help and also in understanding the underlying uh, genetics and and physics and that's really really impressive for all of us. Thank you so very very much. And the last is you know Trinity in Japan we have dinners meetings here in Tokyo. That's how we started seven years ago. And uh, at the moment it's very hard to travel. But uh, when it's uh, easier to travel again, maybe you can come to Japan and we'll set up a an event with you. That would be really really fantastic. That would be my pleasure. So I've been to Japan just once before the pandemic, and I look forward to coming again when it's possible. Yeah. Okay, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, everybody else. And I'm sorry that not everybody could ask a question tonight or today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very thank you. Much. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Thank you for a marvelous talk. Okay, yeah, thank you so very much, Simon. Bye-bye.